Hello again, everyone. So having a good look now at the voltages and currents that we'll be dealing with in AC circuits, we're now looking to find an easy way to manipulate them in the simple expressions like KVL and KCL. So unlike DC circuits, uh, our voltages and currents were simply numbers. Now they're functions of time. They're sinusoidal expressions. Uh, so what we're going to pursue today is a convenient way of representing these, these sinusoids as, once again, numbers. And to help us do that, we're going to use phasers. So once again, our goal is to, to represent sinusoidal voltages and currents in, in a manageable form so that we can use all of our usual circuit analysis methods, as simple as KVL, KCL, and Ohm's law, and to the higher level ones such as node voltage, mesh current, seven and sphere theorem, and superposition. And so uh, phasers is going to allow us to do this very, very simply. All right, now to, to demonstrate the problem, let's imagine a simple circuit, simple loop. And so we'll have a voltage source and some generic circuit elements, and we'll let's just keep it fairly simple so the action, the analysis is pretty straightforward. And so simple loop, and so we've got a single time-varying voltage source. It'll be sinusoidal. That's going to cause a current to flow in a loop, in that loop. That current is going to put up a voltage across each one of the circuit elements. And they'll be sinusoidal as well. And now, just to simplify the problem, let's assume a particular sinusoidal values for each of V1, V2, and V3. So V1 is uh, amplitude 10, phase angle nothing, zero. V2, amplitude 5, phase angle minus 30 degrees. V3, amplitude 5, different phase angle, 90 degrees this time. And so what we want to do is use KVL here to determine the overall voltage, the applied voltage, V of T. And we want to express it in a useful form. In other words, a single cosine with a single magnitude and a single phase angle. So KVL is our starting point, which of course must be satisfied for any, any type of signals, DC, AC, everything. So, and here's, here's KVL around the loop. So no surprises there. So what we're, so we're doing is we're solving for V of T, the over, the, that's the voltage across the source, some of the individual voltages across each of the uh, other circuit elements. Okay, so then the problem is, how do we manipulate that thing? It's certainly not obvious by looking at it, so we need help. Because we want to, again, we want to express this thing in the, in the form of a single cosine wave. And so they, then the question becomes, well, okay, how do we find Vm? And how do we find zeta? A single value for each. Okay, so now... <clears throat> what we'll do is, is is sort of introduce the idea of a phaser, and so let's start with most the most general sort of definition of say a voltage, sinusoidal voltage. So here it is. So V one of T we'll call it. So it's going to have some some amplitude, and that'll be capital V1, so little v1 of t is equal to capital V1 cos omega t plus theta 1. Now omega, just a word about that first, this is usually fixed in value throughout the circuit, and so that we don't normally include this, or we don't, we don't at all include this in our phasor notation. It's still extremely important, as we'll see very shortly, but we use it in a different way. So anyway, so other, apart from omega, we have two key independent variables here. So this is capital V1, which is the amplitude of the thing. And, of course, theta being the other one, and that is the phase angle. So once again, capital V1 is, is a constant. 
<coughs> it's just a number representing the magnitude or peak value of the cosine wave. And theta 1 is the phase angle. So let's outline the basic idea first. So what we have is we have a magnitude, V1, and we have an angle. Well, that is that describes a vector. And so we can draw a vector on a plane with a length of V1 and an angle of theta1. So what we'll be doing when we're adding voltages by KVL, we're adding vectors. So just let's begin with getting a feel for how we how we draw or represent a phaser. So here's here's some simple examples. So we'll, we'll express a couple of voltages here. They don't need to be voltages, they can be currents as well. So on the left, this is the so-called time domain notation. On the right is the phasor domain. So first example, VA of T. So capital, so magnitude VA and phase theta A. So VA with a bar over it means a vector. Capital VA there is its magnitude or amplitude. And theta A, of course, angle. Okay, second example. Let's uh, let's do not cos, but let's do sine. Everything has to be cosines. So first thing to do is convert it to a cosine. So let's take our sine and, and subtract 90 degrees of phase from it. And so phaser, for phaser notation, capital VB with a bar over again, again the vector. So length VB, angle theta B minus 90 degrees. And as I say, same notation for current. So just some arbitrary current, IC cos omega T plus theta C. Same idea for phasor notation. <clears throat> okay, so now with, with all this, now we're, we're about ready to start manipulating them and to be able to do that, we're going to use complex numbers. So you've seen these recently and you know with a start in high school, this is probably your first real application of this stuff. So anyway, let's do a very quick review. This is not comprehensive in any way. This is for our own purposes, and that's about it. This is from also from Appendix B in the textbook. So, so we express these phasers as complex numbers. <coughs> and, and so what features what, what distinguishes complex numbers from ordinary real numbers, is that they have imaginary parts. So, so beginning with uh, what mathematicians call i, which is the square root of negative 1. However, for as engineers, we're using i. i is taken, it's current. And so we're going to use the next letter in the alphabet. Why not j? So j is square root of minus 1. So j squared is equal to minus 1. Okay. So let's little, uh, try some little simple examples here. Here's, here's a simple complex number. 2 plus j4. So two, two, just two clear parts here, the real part by its own, and the imaginary part was the j stuck in front, like so. Together, that is a single complex number. And, and we can draw this complex number as a point. So let's just lay down a point. And it has uh, two axes in this, in this graph. So the um, vertical axis is the imaginary axis, and the, and the horizontal axis is the real axis. So the real component of this number, x, is the uh, projection on the real axis, and its length, 2. And the projection on the imaginary axis is 4. So 2 over and 4 up represents our complex number x. So this is a uh, point. So x is a point on the complex plane. So that's what we've drawn there, the complex plane. Okay, so we often need the conjugate, the complex conjugate of a complex number. So for a number of reasons, as we'll see coming up. So Here's the notation for, for a conjugate. So we stick a star or asterisk representing a 
conjugate. And how we calculate the conjugate is just to take the imaginary part and flip its sign. So it was positive, let's make it negative. If it was negative, let's make it positive. Okay, now an important operation here is to, to switch back and forth between two, two different and important representations of complex numbers. And they are rectangular, so A plus JB is an example of rectangular, and polar, which is in the form of a magnitude and an angle. And so representing both of these on, on the complex plane, so once again, a point representing x. <clears throat> and so in terms of rectangular coordinates, it's uh, over by an amount a, the real part, and the height is, is b, ab above the real axis. So there's the projections onto the two axes. Polar is, is the distance from the origin. So that is the length of the vector m and the angle theta with respect to the positive real axis. Positive real axis is always zero degrees. Conversion between these two things is, is important and we'll be, we'll be relying on this quite, quite, he, quite heavily. And, but the relationship is fairly simple. So, uh, fo, po, polar representation, its magnitude is basically Pythagoras' theorem, a squared plus b squared square root. And arctangent of the imaginary part over the real part forms the angle. Going the other way, A, M cos theta is the projection on the real axis. B, M sine theta is the projection on the real axis. So we'll be doing complex arithmetic. And so let's just do a very quick review of that using simple example 2 plus J4 for X and 4 plus J5 for Y. So addition is is very straightforward but we must do this in the uh, in terms of rectangular coordinates if we have polar form we've got to convert it back so let's check out summation let's add our two numbers well very straightforward simply add the real parts and separately add the imaginary parts so six plus j nine subtraction same deal let's subtract the real parts and subtract the imaginary parts So multiplication and division, we have some choice here, and either way, it's really not pretty. <clears throat> so we can do this either in, in rectangular form or polar form, and let's do it each way. And let's start with rectangular. So product of x and y, so 2 plus j4 times 4 plus j5. So just multiply it out, we get four terms, a plus j10 plus j16, and the final term's got a j squared in it. Remember, that's minus one. So that will contribute to the real part. So the overall number is that. So division is a bit messy. So that's what we're dividing. And so what we're gonna do is use the, the conjugate of the denominator, more four minus j5. And we'll multiply that by the same uh, by the division of the, that and itself. So it doesn't change anything, but it's going to help us simplify the final answer into a proper complex form. So anyway, multiply out the tops, multiply out the bottoms. Notice the j's and the denominator cancel. And it leaves us with this. So we have a real denominator this time. So that was the idea. So now we can separate them into two distinct components, the real and the imaginary part. Polar is actually, the, the process is easier, but we, it's a mess, first of all, getting things into polar notation if you don't already have them there. So let's convert x. So it's magnitude, square root of two squared plus four squared, and the angle arctangent of four over two, which is imaginary over real, and so it leaves us with the magnitude and angle, uh, like so. Same with y. Magnitude is the square root of 4 squared, 5 squared. Arctangent 5 over 4 is the angle. And here are the numbers. 
And now product, the multiplication, is easy. So x times y. So here's where we simply multiply the magnitudes and add the angles. So that's the product in polar form. Division is equally easy. So we divide the magnitudes here and we subtract the angles. And so let's finally annotate the, these each calculation here. So multiply magnitudes, add the angles for multiplication, and then divide the magnitudes and subtract the angles for division. Okay, so just very briefly to sum up. So we talked about representing sinusoidal voltages and currents with something more manageable, phasers. And then we use phasers in in our expressions for KVL, a very, very simple example of KVL. And the, the arithmetic that we use is complex, so each phasor is basically a complex number. And, and finally what we did was just a very brief summary of, of uh, complex numbers and arithmetic. Again, by no means comprehensive, it's only the stuff we need later in the course.